This is Knessa Eo, and today we will be discussing taxes. First, let's talk about the function of taxes. Governments can utilize taxes to do a couple different things. First would be to generally finance government spending. Uh, this can be allocated towards education, infrastructure like roads, parks, um, and national parks as well. They can also be used to discourage bad behavior. In the U.S., we generally refer to these things uh, like sin taxes, and these will be assessed on different items or different products like alcohol and cigarettes. And they can also be used to redistribute resources. So each of us pay taxes, uh, and these can be used to finance things like health care for the elderly in the form of Medicaid. Um, and these are different elements that we can use to redistribute resources in terms of welfare and SNAP programs as well. Taxes do a couple different th things. They increase consumer prices. When the government uh, puts taxes on an item, this will increase the price of cigarettes, for example. They also change buyers' and sellers' decisions. And they can generate deadweight loss. And we can think of deadweight loss generally as a loss in utility for producers or consumers in this case. Uh, and think about it graphically is it cuts into um, producer surplus or consumer surplus. And when we assess the burden of a tax, we will assess which one um, is cut into further. And taxes can improve or reduce overall welfare depending on how the government spends this revenue. So we know that the government utilizes these taxes to raise revenue. Uh, think about this, historically humans have always needed salt to survive. It's a preservative, it helps our food last longer. Uh, and historically, everything from monarchs and moving forward, uh, rulers have taxed salt. And they've done this because demand is relatively inelastic. Um, think about the inelasticity deals with the sense that individuals need the product and therefore small increments or sometimes depending on the elasticity even large increases in price will not deter consumers from uh, purchasing the product and this tax is relatively easy to administer uh, in terms of consumption and tracking so in ancient rome soldiers salaries were paid in salt uh, and this is actually where this or we coin the term being worth one salt and it comes from the sense that individuals were deserving of their pay given that this was the sort of wage that they were receiving and the supply and demand model is very useful for analyzing uh, the different impacts of taxing different products here we have our classic supply and demand model in our model, we can see that our initial competitive equilibrium is at point A, where our supply and demand curve intersect. Now we can suppose that the government imposes a 30% tax, an ad valorem tax, on salt. What this will do is shift the marginal cost curve up by 30%. In our partial equilibrium models, our marginal cost curve and supply curve are synonymous. And so here we can see the shift. What this does is now we can see the result um, we have moved our equilibrium from point A to point B. And following this shift from point A to point B, we can look at the different impacts. So first, looking at our x-axis, we can see that we have reduced the quantity traded from Q star to Q1. We also see on our y-axis that this increases the price paid by consumers from P star to P1. So we can see the different impacts. In this case, the price is actually increased by less than 30%. And we reduce the price received by producers from P star to P zero. So last week we covered uh, competitive equilibriums. And with the competitive equilibrium, we maximize the total surplus. When we implement this tax and shift the equilibrium from point A to point B, we reduce both consumer and producer surplus. This reduction can be seen uh, in our rectangle here in which individuals have lost out on both con the consumer side and the producer side. Thinking about who uh, bears the burden of the tax depends on a couple different things. First, consumers bear most of the burden when the demand curve is inelastic. 
think about the case in which in, or individuals require insulin, they have to purchase insulin regardless of the price in order to maintain their health. And so in this case, um, if the price increases significantly, those individuals will bear most of the burden and the producers will actually receive some of the benefit. And the producers, when the supply curve is more inelastic. So if, produ if producers face the uh, similar constraints, they will take on most of the burden. The salt tax in this case does a couple different things. It raises government revenue and the government revenue is equal to this rectangle in this case. So consumers and producers have both lost out on this rectangle and this rectangle is now uh, sent to the government in the form of revenue. And it reduces the total surplus. Uh, thinking about this little triangle between point A and point B here, this is our dead weight loss created by the salt tax. Thinking about this in a historical context, um, the ancient Chinese government, they taxed salt because demand for salt was very inelastic. Individuals required this in order to preserve their food. Uh, and this does a couple different things. When the demand for a good is very inelastic, the tax has very little impact on the equilibrium quantity. Uh, and so running back to the example of insulin, individuals do require it in order to maintain their health. And so increasing the price or changes in the price aren't going to alter that quantity purchased very significantly. And so different governments or different companies can take advantage of this. Uh, when the, um, It's also the case that when the demand is more inelastic, this will increase revenue raised and it will decrease the amount of dead weight loss. So we maintain a lot of the efficiency um, with any, when we tax inelastic goods. And the impact of the taxes on welfare depends on a couple different things. The first is the size of the dead weight loss. If we have a significant dead weight loss, then this has a larger impact um, on the welfare of consumers and producers. And the welfare depends on how the tax revenue is spent. Um, if this is in the form of reallocating resources back to consumers or producers, then we can justify the implementation of a tax that may be creating uh, a larger amount of dead weight loss. Now we'll work with a used textbook tax. Uh, we'll start with two functions, our willingness to pay function or our demand function, and our willingness to accept function. Um, or our supply function. We can see how this is illustrated graphically. And we have our willingness to accept and our willingness to um, pay. So what is our competitive equilibrium uh, given these two functions? So given that our willingness to pay is equivalent to our demand curve and our willingness to accept is equivalent to our supply curve in order to find our competitive equilibrium, all we need to do is set these equations equal to each other and then solve. So in this case, um, setting these equal to each other, we have Q in both equations. As we solve, we'll solve for Q star in this instance. So Q star is equal to 24. Uh, once we find that this is the case, all we need to do is plug this into either equation and we can see uh, in the willingness to pay function, we plug in Q star and we get 20 minus 12 equal to 8. If we plug it into the willingness to accept, we have 2 plus 6, uh, also equal to 8. And so this gives us P star. So all we need to do is set the equations equal to each other, uh, where our willingness to pay and our willingness to accept are equal. This gives us our competitive equilibrium. And so now thinking about the case of a government imposing a $6 tax on used textbooks. We apply this to the willingness to accept function. So whereas we started off with 2 plus 1 fourth times Q, we now have 8 plus 1 fourth times Q. Um, after doing this, all we need to do is follow the same steps, set this equation equal to our willingness to pay function, and find our new equilibrium price and quantity. So in this case, solving for Q, we get a Q star of 16, and then plugging that back into um, either equation, we find that P star is equal to 12. So following this $6 tax on used textbooks, uh, we can see that our equilibrium quantity has fallen and our equilibrium priced, price has increased. 
thinking about whether this is a good policy depends on the welfare in implications and how much gen uh, dead weight loss is generated in the process. With the salt example, we found that governments utilize that salt tax in order to raise revenue. Sometimes governments utilize taxes in order to change behavior. So sometimes the point of a tax is not only to raise it, but it's also to deter individuals from purchasing different products. Given that this is the case, we have to identify some products as bad, or think of this generally as just products that cause harm to individuals um, if consumed sort of carelessly. So a couple different examples, France, Norway, and Mexico, and Fiji, they all tax sweetened drinks. Uh, Hungary taxes chips, so thinking about potato chips in this case. Uh, and US states tax beer and cigarettes. So um, thinking about a more contemporary example, Colorado also taxes cannabis or marijuana. In 2011, Denmark introduced a specific tax rather than sort of the ad valorem, the lump sum tax that we've, ref that we've been referring to on each kilogram of saturated fat. Uh, and so in this case, the Denmark government is assessing that saturated fat is harmful or bad in this case. And so they're going to put a specific tax or add like a specific element to each kilogram of saturated fat in a given product. And the government collected 10.4 Danish kroner for each kilogram of butter. So these are a couple different ways that governments will utilize taxes to change behavior. Thinking about the efficacy um, or the fairness of these taxes is something that we have to uh, assess a little more critically um, following the introduction of some of these policies. So we can take a look at the butter tax in this case. Um, we can see we have our uh, supply and demand curve here, our initial S1 and our demand curve in the red. We have our competitive equilibrium of A where our supply curve and demand curve intersect. Following the tax, it will increase our marginal cost of butter uh, or increase our supply curve. And so the tax will shift up the supply curve by 10.4 kroner. We can see um, illustrated in our graph here, our shift up in the marginal cost curve. This shifts our equilibrium from point A to point B. And as a result, we reduce our consumption from two kilograms at point A to our new equilibrium of 1.6 kilograms at point B. And the burden in this case falls mostly on our consumers. And so if we take a look at the curves here, our supply curve, so S1 and S2, are both relatively elastic, um, whereas the demand curve relative to the supply curves is much more inelastic. So given that this is the case, most of the burden of this tax is going to fall on consumers. We can further illustrate the burden of this tax uh, looking at each of our different impacts on surplus. So the tax in this case cuts deeper into consumer surplus because of the relative um, elasticity of the curve. The demand curve in this case is more inelastic relative to the supply curve. So the burden falls on the consumers and it reduces producer surplus a much smaller amount. It's still, uh, producers still see a reduction in producer surplus, but this is smaller than the reduction in consumer surplus. The tax raises, so thinking about the revenue raised by the tax, is essentially the area of our green rectangle here. So we can see the height in this case is our 1.6, um, or sorry, our base here is our 1.6 kilograms for our quantity, and then we have a 10 kroner uh, approximately increase. Given that this is the case, we have 160 kroner per person tax or revenue raised per year. So the tax has two positive effects in this case. In one sense, our green rectangle here is all our revenue raised. So the tax is raising revenue. And the second element is that it has reduced our butter consumption from two kilograms per year to 1.6 kilograms per year. So the intuition here is that the individuals within the country are now healthier and the government has revenue as a result of this tax. 
So thinking about our butter tax and assessing sort of uh, the qualitative aspects of it, if butter is a bad, if it's harmful, then we can uh, sort of ignore the dead weight loss in the process. And unit 12 will show how taxes on negative externalities can increase total surplus. Uh, so different things in which third parties are harmed um, can actually, if we impose taxes on different elements like that, uh, we can actually increase the total surplus. In this case, Denmark abolished the butter tax after 15 months because it was costly to administer. So thinking about the ideal tax system or just sort of the ideal functionality of a tax system will have a couple different elements. The first being that it has low collection costs. So the butter tax, we saw that it raised revenue and it decreased the quantity. However, it was too costly uh, to track. So that sort of um, puts it out of our ideal tax system. And the other element that we need is we need a tax that generally generates little dead weight loss. Uh, so in this case, um, in a couple of our examples, we've talked about one of the best ways to sort of identify this is by finding a good that has a very inelastic demand. Uh, in this case, a more inelastic demand will reduce the de uh, dead weight loss generated in the process. Thinking about taxes and how they relate to politics, um, these have been some of the fundamental arguments since the revolution. Uh, we can see Mahatma Gandhi in 1930. The Salt March was one of the primary steps in terms of determining the path uh, for independence from Great Britain. And we can see Colorado, this is in 2018, Amendment 73, which failed to pass. It would have adopted a more progressive income tax and this would have raised a lot of revenue for K through 12 education. Uh, a couple different other measures like more recently, a lot of you probably participated in the voting process uh, and you must have saw Proposition EE, which taxed um, e-cigarettes, so things like jewel products and so forth. Those were taxed and that actually passed. So now the government will increase the price and hopefully reduce uh, the quantity um, purchased for those products to reduce the harm on individuals while also raising government revenue for education. A couple different things when thinking about your effective tax rate. Um, you have to first come up with a couple elements. How much income are you earning in a year? Then thinking about how much tax do you pay uh, within each year? And following from that, your effective tax rate will be your, ta your taxes divided by your income. The U.S. tax system in this case is relatively flat. And uh, I would strongly encourage a lot of you, if you're interested in different tax systems, to take a look at this taxjusticenow.org. Uh, it's a wonderful website um, put together by different individuals like Emmanuel Saez uh, and Gabriel Zuckman. Uh, but if you're interested in a couple different elements, uh, and especially in terms of different presidential candidates' tax plans, this illustrates a lot of those facts um, in a pretty salient manner. But the U.S. tax system, in our case, is relatively flat. Um, we can go across the different uh, income deciles and so forth. But we do have a progressive tax system for income. Our tax rate increases as income increases. A regressive tax would be an example in which a tax rate declines with income. So as your income increases, you're paid less and less. That would be a regressive tax. And uh, just within this website, there's a lot of different things. You can see the breakdown of the US tax system uh, in terms of health, value added, consumption, and payroll taxes, and so forth. Uh, but it's just very, um, it's a very interesting site for you to sort of identify different elements. Thinking about whether the US tax system is efficient is a much more difficult question. Uh, and even more difficult than that is thinking about whether our tax system is fair. So these are different elements that I encourage you um, to sort of go to this website take a look at different uh, candidates or different tax systems and see which one you think or which one you feel is most fair.